one of the things that the Accord 11 trial um, was clear to me was the importance of chemotherapy in this disease. I think we underestimate because of the relative low response rates and uh, the ultimate outcome of the disease. When we look at one of the few trials we have in pancreatic cancer that actually has quality of life in it, you know, they measured the deterioration of quality of life because most of the patients had good quality of life to start with. They select, you know, perfect organ function patients with echocardiogram performance starts zero to one. As the patients progress, their quality of life starts to drop was almost a parallel curve. And uh, this tells me that the patient's quality of life did not drop because of even of the toxicity, they dropped because of cancer progression. And in pancreatic cancer, in, we all see the curves, you know, it's like you have this, you know, very narrow drop that soon after the curve takes off, it drops and then it levels off. So it's important in my opinion that one do not wait too long to go into second line treatment because their quality of life drops very quickly as they progress. And uh, you know, the patients tend to, to say, oh, maybe I should take a break and so forth. We should be very cautious about that. And I like the approach that I'm giving the patient a break with a known cross um, toxicity regimen. I mean, you're getting away from a regimen that the neuropathy is actually reversible most of the time with uh, nabipaclitaxel, but it's still you have neuropathy, and you go to a regimen that has no neuropathy. Yeah. We have to be careful. Uh, if you have a, a very chemosensitive disease, or relatively sensitive chemosensitive disease, you can mitigate the worsening of the quality of, uh, of the performance status. Uh, but you, you really have to have a disease where chemotherapy gives you response rates of maybe 30, 40 percent to really have that sort of, uh, in pancreatic cancer, in the Napoli one trial, the response rate, if I remember correctly, was 16 percent. So that's not, and that's in a selected group of patients. So we don't have regimens that you can use in the second line, thinking that I'm just going to reverse the down, down, uh, downward trend of the quality of life or the performance status. In fact, my concern is you can make it worse. For what is the gain of a few weeks or or a month or two? That's if a patient wants to go through it, I don't have a problem. But really. The expectations have to be laid down on the patient, but also we have to support them better. I mean, again, we go back to supportive care. We don't do a very good job in supportive care. Well, I think that's a really important point. Excellent supportive care, keeping patients as, as uh, f fewer impacts from the symptoms that they're having is really going to uh, play a huge role in what you can give them exactly. for chemotherapy and ultimately what their response is going to be. Um, and so it is at least as important uh, to choose the right chemotherapy as to try to get their symptoms under control. And that's, and, and I, I agree that we, we don't necessarily do the best job that we can there. I agree. You gotta get your nurse practitioners in there, you gotta get your chemotherapy nurses in there, you gotta get your palliative care palliative people care. in there. You got to have them fully supported. I, oh, do I, not, uh, not I, I do not use the word palliative because palliative really doesn't work. It, it's, not a, it's not a word that you want to use here. Uh, if you really want to implement this, use supportive care because that's much more acceptable because palliative care somehow links to hospice and you don't want to, it, it, it's, it's semantics, but it, it, the reality is that. There's no harm in using the word hospice, and there are studies from Yale that show if you introduce hospice early on, patients have better mind, they're, they're more at peace, and their quality of life also goes up. So let's not be afraid of what happens to our advanced cancer patients, so. Yeah, I, I, when I, I trained in England, and we had outpatient hospice, which was implemented very early on. But in this country, you have this, you go to hospice, you go out of the other care. I could make a joke, but I won't. So. Yeah, well, I think, I, think cer <laughs> I think certainly the data is starting to come around within the United States, too, of the importance of having the supportive care or palliative care. Either one, care for the patient, patient-centered care. Yeah, that's I mean, that's our job. It, it really, it's, yeah. it's, it's a yeah. continuum of care. It's not black or white. And I think we, we tend to uh, make an artificial distinction between palliative care uh, and oncology when it's really it's one, uh, two sides of the same coin or what have you, but it's, it really is a continuum and we have to be great at both.